It is my time. It is 5.45, 16 seconds. So, hi, everyone. Um, you're here for this talk and not any of the two or three other community-focused talks of this particular time slot. Um, I realize you have options when selecting a time a session at OzCon and I, or OzBridge. God. <laughs> and I really appreciate it. Okay, Black Bolt, out of here. <laughs> All right. Um, so, me, I am VM Brasur, a.k.a. Vicky Brasur. Um, so if you run into me in the hall, don't go, ha ha, you're a virtual machine. No, I'm not. Um, I just go by VM Brasur online. If you want to find me anywhere, search VM Brasur. There I am. But if you run into me face to face, feel free to call me Vicky or VM or V. Um, I am a technical manager. I run software engineering departments um, and do project management and uh, business consulting for startups and whew, lots of other things. Um, do marketing and just all sorts of interesting things having to do with tech. So um, the format of this particular talk is going to be a lot of front loading of data and then ideally we will have time for discussion and group therapy. It is data driven group therapy day today here at Oz no, Ozbridge. Um, so uh, just a reminder for everyone uh, if other speakers haven't told you yet each talk for Bridge has a uh, wiki page, and you can find it as you look at the talk page on the schedule. Along the right-hand side, you'll see something that says session notes. Um, you have to be logged in, obviously, to do this, but click that, and if there's any notes you wish to add, go there. I will be adding the slides there later. I will be adding my references there later, so if you want all that stuff, just that's going to be your central repository for all things for this session. So, got a lot of crap to cover, so let's dive in really briefly because this isn't about me. Um, so until recently, I did not contribute to open source at all. Now I con do contribute to two small projects, one of which I started, but until recently I didn't. Um, I do participate at a community level, Pearl are my people, represent. Um, so uh, I also do uh, evangelism and just general open source support. I think open source is great otherwise. You know, you guys wouldn't be here, so you believe likely uh, the same. Um, when I was at a job a few uh, companies ago, I started something called Free Software Fridays. Um, it was a company that made all of its money running on the back of open source software and never contributed back. I thought that was kind of crappy. So um, I gave all of my developers permission to take four hours every Friday, assuming they were up to date on their work, to contribute to any open source project they wanted. Um, so that was part of my way to contribute when I wasn't actually contributing. You know, try and enable others to get stuff done. And frankly, that's what a manager does, right? Um, so that's what I did. Um, but when I started working with these other projects and starting to think of starting my own, I thought, well, you know, I've never done this before. Why? Being the introspective sort I am, why have I never done this before? And I came up with my own personal list of reasons that are not necessarily important here, so we're not going into them. But um, I started thinking, well, am I normal? Am I just like everyone else who doesn't contribute to open source software? And like a good geek, I decided I needed to collect data. So I started a survey um, and I put it out there. I worked with uh, Jacinta Richardson and asked Andy Lester to uh, kind of finesse the uh, responses on the survey or the questions to the survey. Um, so I didn't just rely on my own input. I did get other external important. They were invaluable. Um, so I wanted it to be really simple. The design goal, low barrier to entry. I want people to get in, get out, not look at it and go, what, this survey is going to take me 10 minutes? Screw that. I've got important stuff to do. No, um, I wanted it to take like two minutes max. Um, so simple survey. Simple turned out not to be simple because while talking to Jacinta and uh, Andy, we discovered that, yeah, there are people who don't contribute to open source software, but then there are people who contributed to projects and left. And then they're the organizers themselves, and they ought to have some input on this. So what was one survey turned it into one survey with three tracks. Um, here's the responses. Um, I apologize in advance if you can't read them, but I believe you should. They look pretty good from the front of the room anyway. I don't know about the back. Um, I got 107 responses in total. This was primarily from just hitting up my Twitter network. I don't know if anybody took this, but um, yeah. Uh, so I have about... Half of them are people who used to contribute, 
half or 23 percent or 23 people 21 percent were organizers and the rest were, had never contributed which was great because these are people who never contributed and whoa they're playing in a survey so they obviously are engaged in some way um so it not a really scientific survey looking for more of a general gestalt feeling of what's going on in the open source world um, the definitions of these things of project of contributor um, and organizer I leave as an exercise to the person taking the uh, survey you know we're not going to define someone else's role for them so again not particularly uh, scientific but very informative so I'm going to go through my results primarily for all of these things. I'm going to start with the organizers. Um, the organizers was the most comprehensive of the section of the survey. I believe I had five questions, five whole questions. Um, how many here are project organizers for open source of some variety? Okay, so pretty decent. Um, so I got 23 respondents for this section. Um, and again, my assumption is the respondents are organizers. I, whether they are or not, I'm going to take it on faith that they are. My very first question is, for your project, what do you do well? And almost half of the people, 43% uh, said, yeah, we do mentoring well. We do that. 30% um, believe that they do uh, patch docs uh, for patch submission and starter issues. Um, they do that well. What I found really really amusing is that 22% say we don't do any of these well none at all which was kind of telling um, that there is already a perceived issue within just organizers that something ain't right uh, so and with every single one of these questions I have another because I know that I do not know all and there are plenty of things I don't consider I want people to chime in with that so as far as other for this People um, said that they do code sprints and pairing, which is really great. Uh, one person mentioned they do co uh, step zero items, which is something I have fallen desperately, desperately in love with, is the, con the phrase step zero, and I can get to that later. Step zero. Um, meeting at the bar, time-honored open source tradition. Um, poor, the really bad ones. Uh, A, you have no luck in getting... Uh, contributors at all sadly truly sadly but I have to wonder again what are they doing and what are they not doing out of context all of these responses out of context um, it was also entirely anonymous so I have no idea who submitted these the ones that we do nothing well and we do none of these well so there are organizers out there who are aware that they are doing a poor job um, <laughs> I don't know what to do with that yet, um, but I'm parsing. So the next question is, okay, that's what you do well, so what can you improve? Um, <laughs> nobody, nobody said that they have no changes needed. Everybody sees there is room for improvement, which is great. That's life, right? The entire, all of life is room for improvement. Um, but most people say, 74% of them say, yeah, we need to do tutorials better, or at all. Um, better document how to get started, 61% uh, people saying that. 57% say we need to document non-code submissions. Um, mentoring, 52%. Start here issues, 48%. So people see that there's a need for this sort of stuff. Most of it is documentation related. Okay. Um, so as usual, there's another, not just once, we're going to meet twice at the bar. This is our improvement. I can't argue with that, but uh, weekly, monthly, something like that might be a little better. Um, friendly channels, I don't understand. Friendly IRC channels, or is it friendly any channels of communication? Uh, yeah, but it's, again... So many unfriendly IRC channels. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. P5P, uh, what? P5P, what? Um, so, uh, next question. So uh, I, I come from a marketing background. Um, I spent six years uh, managing software engineering department at online marketing. And in the process, I learned all things totally deep dive on marketing. So switching, switching costs, switching barriers. Why do people either move to or move away from your product? As 
anyone who's doing product development, be it software or anything, you need to know these things. It really helps guide your roadmap and show you what you have to do. So I was like, naturally people are asking. You showed up to my project and then you turned around and walked away. I want to know, what am I doing wrong? How can I fix it? And as you can see from this graph, only five of the 23 people said they do this. Um, so of those five people, I got five responses. You know, what have you heard when you ask people? Um, and predominantly what they hear is that it's external forces. It's completely out of my control. Um, you know, it's life, it's work, and I just don't have the time. That's common. It happens. There's nothing necessarily you as an organizer can do to change that. But what I have to wonder is whether these five people, and frankly, even my survey, has a strong selection bias. Just a sec, Mike. Um, because maybe you're asking people, and the ones who are you really cheesed off, they're not going to answer you, right? Or they're going to give you a really soft sell. It's like, oh, it's not you, it's me. So I don't know how strongly I should take this, except I do, because I also did a survey for contributors and non-contributors. This don't match. <laughs> yes, Michael? Uh, uh, did you go back to the Maybe? Yes. <laughs> Right. I was wondering if there's a gap between people that you've asked and didn't hear from. They did not say. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, quick survey. Yeah, it, yeah. I, a really much more in-depth survey would be amazing. But this is, think of this as a warm-up act. So, um, so the people who didn't ask, I asked, well, okay, if you're not asking, why? Because obviously there's some good reason for this. Most of people, lack of resources. Um, by the way, if you're looking for contributors, you can farm this crap out. All right, so this is a non-coding way to get people engaged. That's just a little editorial. I'm not supposed to be saying that in the data display, but um, so most of the people are lack of resources, 43%. 30% have never so thought to do this. And this, again, from my really strong marketing background, I think of this and go, oh, gasp, how could you not consider it? Well, my point of view is not everyone else's point of view, right? This is not obvious stuff to everyone, which it gets back to, you know, the non-obvious things, the documentation. I'm doing the exact same thing the organizers are doing when I have that reaction. Um, and 26% of them say they just don't want to nag people. We are sweet people across the board. They're really nice ways to say, OMG, you left. Why? That's not nagging. You know, you don't have to keep poking them to say, why did you leave? 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 You just send them an email or something say, hey, if there's anything we can improve, let me know. Um, if there's any particular reason you left that I, you want me to know, let me know. Don't have to nag, you just have to ask. Totally different things. Um, so again, standard other. What is the other? Um, primarily that things were dwindling. There's not a lot of contributors, not a lot of people there. Um, all projects, everything has a life cycle. With it, I don't care what the product is, I don't care if it's potato chips or if it's software. Everything has a life cycle and there is an ebb and a flow. These were primarily at the outward, which is, that's ebb? Anyway, doesn't matter, moot point. Um, so uh, the final question of all of these sections is, okay, tell me more. Just open forum, tell me something. Um, for each of these tell me more sections in all three uh, tracks of the survey. Um, I got a lot of data. Uh, I only selected little bits. These are excerpts. The full data is available in my, um, in my repository that I will be sharing later. Uh, so ask them what they want. Um, little selection. Again, natural life cycle. This is the natural life cycle of a project. It started off with a limited target audience to begin with. So naturally, you're not going to have a lot of contributors. They're cool with that. Um, Another question, or another thing, the project was, again, limited audience, by programmers, for programmers. Um, what this person pointed out, and I hadn't considered, is items by programmers, for programmers, often have low participation, but high quality. So um, the few contributors that they have are actually quite good. So they're not too concerned, usually. Um, except, you know, you always get those, the, the uh, 
car wreck people who, if they get in a car wreck, everything goes, yeah, pear-shaped. So this could be a problem. Um, now to tell me more, um, somebody who has been a mentor with other opportunities, this opened my eyes to something is that I don't think we have enough uh, possibilities out there within open source to mentor the mentors. You know, we have a lot of discussion about how we can bring people in and how we can onboard them, this, which is what this is, but we don't really have a lot of, here's how you physically project manage a project. You know, how do you teach someone to keep people happy, to keep shit on the rails, frankly. I mean, and, and that's rails with a little r, not a big r. Um, so, you know, mentoring the mentors. I hadn't really thought about that a lot until I read this and, and parsed it. Um, last one, here's the saddest of all. Poor onboarding contributed to the death of my open source project. So, um, obviously, there's a, people are aware of issues here. So, from the, the uh, organizers, what have I learned? Um, I have learned that every single organizer out there, and I actually would like a show of hands, how many of you who are organizers think that you don't need to improve your contributor process? I, honest to God, am serious, because if I can find one, I want to pick your brain. Okay, great, awesome. Um, so uh, they all need to improve things, um, and they need to support onboarding and just general support, uh, care and feeding of your community. People realize this is an issue. Um, also, good lord, documentation is seen both as necessary but lacking. Um, and we all know this, we all love this. Uh, very few places have uh, tutorials, most of them think they should. If you have docked processes, most of them think they should. You have a chicken in the egg bootstrapping problem here. How do you get people to write the docs without first having a way for them to learn to write the docs? So um, that is an interesting process flow that I feel I need to parse a little more because it's a sticky problem. Um, you know, it's, and a lot of this is documentation debt, right? And that's, whew, we all have been there. Pardon? There's maintaining and there's also starting things which were never there. They're both a form of debt, frankly. Yes, sir? Um, no, well, I, I, excuse, uh, so I will repeat for the recording. Um, this gentleman has helped people start organization or start organizing, work on organizing, and um, they want to talk about really fundamental things. And his response is, I'm sorry, it's a make file, and I'm sorry, but that's wrong. Because this is the step zero problem. And this and this is the step zero problem um, and this is why we are now starting to get open hatch and I'm scheming in my brain a step zero website for this sort of stuff so we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel for every single project um, but it do not neglect that because that is a barrier to entry to getting people but I will get to this so well, I will move on um, more things I've learned is that um, organizers have forgotten what it's like to be the new kid I'm sorry I, I need to Maybe I can move it over here, but then I'm off camera. Oh no, this is brilliant. I, I can see myself right there. Um, so, uh, is this better for you? Can you see? Pardon? Oh, oh well then, everybody's happy. I love that. Um, so organizers have forgotten what it's, uh, how many here have had to move schools when you were a kid? Okay. My father was in the US Navy. We did this a lot. Every time you go to a new school, it sucks. There is no other word for it. It really sucks. And if you're an organizer and you've been through that, think of what it's like for your new contributors to come on. You know, do you want them to feel like that? Just, just conceptualize what it feels like to be the new kid again and see if you can't do something to kind of minimize that trauma. Because it's definitely traumatic sometimes. Um, so, Running low on time, not really, but I want lots of time for us to chat. Uh, contributor survey. How many here contribute to open source projects? Okay. Um, so I had 52 respondents for this. There were two questions. One was one of the, you know, choose all that apply, and the other one is a free text. Um, 
again, very low barrier to entry, try and get as many people through and as much data as possible. And again, the definition of contributor and project, leave as an exercise to the person taking the survey. I'm not going to identify your role for you. Um, so the question I asked is, why did you stop participating in this? That is one of my assumptions. You did participate once and then you stopped. Um, 50% of the people who uh, responded to this said that it was real life. 48%, and this one surprised me. I didn't, it surprised me at first, but after I thought about it, it was like, oh, well, yeah. They scratched their itch and then they moved on. Think of it as tactical open source submissions. Yeah, just get in, get out, high speed, low drag. Uh, 35% of them got bored or distracted, which I lay firmly at the feet of the project managers for this. If you're not keeping shit interesting, people are going to walk out the door. Same thing if you're managing a software engineering team. If you're not keeping your people engaged, they're going to walk out the door. Same thing for marketing. If you're not keeping people engaged, it's kind of a people need engagement. We like that. 35% um, ran out of tasks. Again, project managers, keep that going. You know, keep people's pipelines full so they can keep learning and growing and contributing more. So, and then we get to the very sad part. 23% left because there was a mean community. 13% left because they were feeling ignored. 17% felt they were unappreciated. All told, 65% of the people who responded left because they didn't feel welcome. There was a high jerk factor. Okay, this is uncool. Um, as usual, I got an other. The data I got from other, predominantly that it's employer work concerns. Um, others, the project appeared complete or dormant. Um, poor experience, no step zero. People couldn't get started. They just couldn't do it. There was no physical way to do it without pestering the crap out of someone. And nobody wants to be that person, right? So um, my second question was, again, the free text. Hey, just share. It's open source. We like doing that. Um, so what follows are, again, selected snippets, full data is available. Um, there were four primary categories of responses. I will summarize them for you, each with one example, unless I screwed up the deletion of slides. Itch scratched or work or life, right? Um, so I tend not to continue to follow projects that are outside of my current focus. Used to use something for work, work put you on a different project, you'll contribute to what you then need, right? That makes sense. Not much as an organizer you can do about that. Next one, step zero slash documentation. People can't help themselves. You can't tell people to RTFM if there is no TFM, right? Um, so this is a problem, uh, but this is the one that the contributors or the organizers actually perceived. Um, here's one. I'm new to coding. I don't feel confident contributing my green thumb code to major features or bugs in the process and the projects. I have resorted to doc fixes and things, but they get boring. So I feel this has to do with me and not the projects. Oh, I just want to walk up to this person, hug them and say, honey, it's not you. It's really not. Um, there's no, not a lot of step zero for this person to help to start coding, like just from bare metal on up. Um, there doesn't appear to be much management or, or mentoring. There's very poor project management because there doesn't appear to be any simple bugs split out for people to start sort of diving into. Um, there's poor community management, if nothing else, because this person doesn't feel appreciated. And that's unfortunate because if there is one thing in life which is more valuable than a person's time, then please, dear Lord, show it to me. There's just nothing more valuable than somebody's time, and they're willing to give it to you. They want to give it to you, and you're not letting them. Um, the most precious thing in their life, and you're turning it away. So um, third category is poor project management. We saw a little of it on the last slide, but whoa, buddy, was this huge. People in the uh, comments really like this. Um, mismanagement is the number one reason I leave a project usually manifests itself in poor communication of ideas and goals to community members who want to participate. Poor project management, poor community management. Just because you're great with tech doesn't mean you're good at running a project. And the faster we all realize that and either seek help or hand it off to someone else, delegating is great, by the way. It is an amazing way to bring people in, make them feel valued, and allow you to work to your strengths. We all have different strengths. Just because you thought of the idea doesn't mean you need to run the project in this way. 
Um, so this one I kept in here because it was so charming and it reminded me of something. I don't know what I can do because too less bug and no defined roadmap. Um, it is, it's, it's really cute um, and it drove home to me that not all contributors speak my language. And there's got to be a way, and I don't know how to do it, um, and, and it's certainly, well, Unicode would help. It's not all, Nick. <laughs> this, in this case, it's a different sort of communication boundary. Um, and I'm going to talk more slowly because Sarah's taking a photo. Click. Okay. Um, <laughs> hey, coffee man. <laughs> Watch it. So uh, the fourth category, uh, jerks. This is me sanitizing things, because this is not what I call them. Um, there's one major open source project that I no longer use or contribute to because the principal maintainer is notoriously abrasive. This is a comment I got. This is actually something I'm, yeah. This is a, a, an issue I'm wrestling with right now because I believe I have found a uh, replacement. This is a quote. Yeah, quote, actual quote. This isn't me. Um, but I am struggling with this right now because I found a replacement for Google Reader. Um, anyone, if you want to know, let me, I'll tell you later. But um, the chief maintainer of this project is a flaming asshole and prides himself on it. And I don't know if I can support that in any way. He doesn't care, frankly, one way or another whether I use his project. So me not using it isn't going to stop him from being an asshat. But it is a consideration for me. Um, so. Dealing with the jerks is out of scope of this talk, and wow, I should have brought an umbrella. Yay, Portland. Um, we don't use umbrellas here. It's the dumb. Come on. I, I look like, okay, back on task. I'm on a timer. <laughs> um, so uh, dealing with the jerks is outside of the scope of this talk. Other people have done it in full-fledged talks. Um, there are plenty of resources available, including potentially some people in this room. Um, so, uh, but real quick. Two of my favorites for this, Bob Sutton has written a book called The No Asshole Rule. If you have not read it, dear Lord, buy it now. Good God, yes. Um, the No Asshole Rule, it's written from a business point of view, um, but he goes into hard data. This is how much it costs you to have an asshole on your team. This is what happens when your asshole goes away. Surprise, all this stuff that your asshole did and he was a rock star, you know, ninja sort of guy, someone picks it up. And your project or your company doesn't actually suffer. And there's a remarkable ROI of kicking your asshole off your team. And he goes into great detail. It's amazing. Um, this book is referenced in my other favorite thing, it, which is Donnie Burkholz is doing this talk up and down the world. It is uh, Assholes Are Killing Your Project. Um, you can find videos of it uh, out there on the web, but there's also one in the references that I'll give you later. Um, Donnie has a lot of additional references in this talk, so go there, read Bob's book. Bob's your uncle. He's not. Well, that's... Okay, th whoa, that didn't work. Anyway, so um, what have I learned from the contributors? So there are essentially two segments of defectors from projects. Um, there's the, eh, life happens, each just gets scratched, there's not a lot you can do f uh, about this as a, uh, an organizer, you can try to re-engage the people or keep them engaged who are just scratching their itches and doing the tactical uh, pull requests and then getting out. Um, so you can do that, but it might not be worth your time. Um, but the other uh, category of defectors is the people who deal with stuff you can fix, right? The poor project management, get help, just do it. Um, step zero, you know, don't assume anything. Um, project management in general seems to really blow and people hate it and get the jerks off your team. Right? These are the things that contributors are actually saying are driving them away. So if you care about keeping your contributors, and you may not, and that is totally valid, this is a valid life choice to not care if your contributors leave, but if you do care, these are some things that you might need to address. Just you know, do a little project introspection and uh, figure this out. So non-contributor survey. How many non-contributors in the audience, and I was one until recently, so there is no shame, at least not for me. Awesome. Superb. Cool. Okay. Great. I love that you guys are here. You're, you're, you know, while I'm talking to the organizers, I'm really talking to you guys to see, you know, what 
you can do for this. So 32 people, 32 respondents for this, um, which again, considering these are people who have not contributed yet, I thought this was a great turnout for non-contributors to fill out a survey. Um, in sales and marketing, we call these people pre-qualified candidates, aka low-hanging fruit organizers. Please take note of what these people have to say because these are the ones who really want to help but are walking away at the front door. Um, so again, similar to the contributor survey, two questions, high speed, low drag, get in, get out. Why have you not participated? Um, 59%, 59, just couldn't tell where to start, right? 50%, real life intervene. <laughs> Kids, puppies, lives, works. 12% um, didn't think the project needed their help. Organizers, what the heck? 25% um, in total of these have the jerk effect. Um, so this is much lower than the contributors where it was a shocking 65%, which leads me to believe that the ass hats don't show their true colors until you've come on board. Um, so, uh, uh, and as usual, we've gotten other for people to fill things in. Um, general categories of these, you've got life happens, you've got work concerns, which falls into life happens. Um, this one was interesting. A restrictive IP policy wouldn't allow, it's like, oh, that's so sad. Um, Self-confidence, that's something which potentially as an organizer you can do something about, but potentially not. That's kind of wibbly wobbly there. Um, stylistic differences, this was a little interesting for me to read. I was like, what, they use two space tabs or something? I don't know, but apparently there was an issue with this. Um, so uh, the second question for the non-contributors, just like contributors, just, hey, you know, let's talk. Tell me more. Um, so again, excerpts, um, full data, get used to hearing me say that. Four categories again, as before, um, first one, as usual. These are going to look real familiar because they're almost exactly like what the contributors said. It just scratch, work happens, life happens, um, eh. Um, one person, the best laid plans often get checked by work in the experience. And I don't know whether work is, I just don't have time, or work means, well, um, you know, they just kind of won't let me. They own all my code, whether I'm in the office or not, and one of those pieces of crap. Um, here's a life happens, has been an active user for a long time, but the commitment required to making meaningful contribution is beyond the available time right now. Hi, organizers, you've just failed. Because there should be a way to, for people to make small changes. Just because it's a small change doesn't mean it's not important. Hey, so find a way to split things up so that people can make small changes. You don't have to add whole new features. Um, you don't have to internationalize the entire project. I'm going to just pick on internationalization because Nick's in the room. Um, I like to call these things up. You know, I got you back, man. Um, so this is, while it is the, the contributor or the uh, respondent perception is that life happens, my interpretation is, organizer, you failed. Um, so, uh, second category, step zero documentation. Ooh, doesn't that look familiar? Uh, quote for that. It's challenging to get started as one often doesn't know where to begin and might not have the time to dedicate to reviewing the entire history of a project in order to know where one's efforts might best be deployed. This one was well phrased as well. I really appreciate the grammar and syntax on this. Um, so this is step zero. This is general documentation. This is documentation debt. This is poor project management as well because it's not obvious where somebody can start, right? So you've got to find a way to make it easy. Grease the rails to get people in the door. That is what I'm hearing over and over again. And what I'm also hearing over and over again is that there is piss poor project management. Um, I've submitted bugs to several open source projects but never committed code for any. Orga organizer failed. Um, well, again, I'm allowing people to self. Well, here, it's there's a perception that a bug submission is not a contribution. Where, as we all know, God, they're so valuable. Um, thank you for my remote QA team. <laughs> That's what that is. Uh, there's a perception that code patches are the only way to contribute. That's what I'm reading here. It, that would be a great thing. We can, hopefully I can get enough time that we can start discussing some, uh, not only horror stories, but ways to get around them. Um, pardon? Rock on. Yeah. 
I love the little count. I never use the little countdown things on Keynote, by the way. If you've ever not used them, you miss now. So um, this is all also really poor project and community management, right? You're not managing anything here. You're just kind of throwing things up in the air and hoping somebody catches it, which is not a good way to keep things going. So um, it, this one was interesting. It, it drove home a point which I realize but don't recognize. Uh, the few times I've said to people, I think your project is project is interesting. How can I get involved? I've gotten little to, little to no response. By the way, I'm reading these out for the people on the video. Um, I didn't have an agenda for something I wanted to change, so I generally, genuinely was looking for suggestions on where I could be of help. This is somebody, and I've excerpted this from the full, this was quite a long comment. This is somebody who actually codes quite well. And this drove home to me that novice contributor does not equal novice programmer. And it also means that just because somebody knows how to program doesn't mean that you don't need step zero, right? You still need to tell this person, well, this is how you install the project. Here's how you set up your dev environment for this. Here's how you can run it on an additional server. Here's how you can test it. You know, just because they're a programmer doesn't mean they know this crap for your project. So novice programmer or novice contributor does not mean novice programmer or, well, anything else, frankly. And again, fourth category, jerks. Uh, full disclosure, the next slide I do not agree with on some, but not all of the levels, and it was personally directed at a very dear friend of mine, um, but it just, it's, their opinion is as valid as anyone else's, and so I believe it needs to see the light of day. Um, the open source community is in a hostile state at the moment. While a code of conduct is a good tool, some very unreasonable people are making people in some communities uncomfortable with their evangelism, bullying, grandstanding, witch hunting, and overt hypocrisy in the name of diversity. Okay, and that's not even air quotes, that's like actual quotes. Ego and activism have no place at the table when discussing policy changes that have far-reaching effects. Ego, maybe. Um, so, um, you have my... my take on this and I again you I read this and I instantly see negative things um, so what you read and what they read are your opinions and that's totally valid um, but what I see <laughs> oh no that might have been my fault um, so uh, my first reaction is this is a programmer this is somebody clinging to a status quo this is somebody who has an axe to grind um, so, but that doesn't mean that they may have a legitimate axe to grind, I don't know. Um, but it counters many things I personally believe in, which are uh, uh, the code of conduct and activism to, make, to improve diversity and make things better, and the fact that people who are uncomfortable with that sort of stuff are often the ones who nurture inequality and elitism. But, but it is a valid point that people perceive this, okay? And as an organizer, you have to keep this in mind. Um, so uh, it's, you, you can't stop these people from talking. You should hear everything they have to say because it reflects on your project and there may be changes you need to make. Um, so what have I learned from the non-contributors? Um, so there's the usual issues of you know, life and work. Um, but otherwise, it's very, very similar to uh, the contributors, which, uh, as you might notice, does not necessarily reflect what the organizers themselves are seeing. And that was what I really loved. That was my main takeaway from all this. Um, poor project management, step zero or step one half, even if you want to assume they know how to use a text editor or something like that, and that there are jerks, which we all know, unfortunately. Um, so bringing it all together. <laughs> so... Um, do we have to document all the things? <laughs> Guess what the next slide is? Hells yes, we have to document all the things, right? Um, so people who write documentation are the true gods of any software project and deserving of our adoration. I will, you know, I will go all Greek on you and pour libations whenever you want, right? Uh, sorry, classicist. <laughs> um, step zero is critical. Document this stuff. Give people a way to help themselves. Again, you can't RTFM without TFM. So um, you have to start early. You have to bake this, start baking it into the culture of your community. Um, foster culture, which is desperately in 
in Smith with explaining things for posterity, right? This is a core belief that we have to write this stuff down for the future. Okay, um, wow, really? I have seven. <laughs> um, so uh, education always will trump innovation. You have to believe that, otherwise you're going to lose people at the door. Step zero, zero or die. Assume nothing, gain everything. Okay, period, dot, end. Do not assume somebody knows how to use your project. Do not assume necessarily somebody knows how to do a pull request. Do not assume somebody knows how to run a patch. Do not assume they know how to run diff or even know how to read it. Or even that to do the right way to read it, you should throw all these extra flags on there. <laughs> oh yeah, we all feel that pain. Um, so I like to think of step zero and contributing to open source projects a lot like puns, right? Uh, again, classicist, uh, Latin degree, five and a half years of ancient Greek. They were really funny people, those Greeks. High fucking hilarious. But we don't get it because their puns don't translate to our language. Step zero. The way we talk doesn't translate into the language of new contributors. So we kind of have to do a sort of internationalization day, um, <laughs> for our own projects, right? Don't assume anything. Um, what I would love to do is to figure out a way to measure bounce rate for a project. And this is really big on uh, websites. You all have seen it, I'm sure, on Google Analytics if you have to look at that. But it's also big for marketing and stuff. People come in and then they bounce out, right? How can we measure that for for a specific project. I don't know, I have, I, but I would love to see some data on that. So um, again, there are references. This will be on the wiki page uh, probably later today. So you can go, but it's on my Zotero group, so you can just go and look at that. Um, Zotero is awesome and it's open source. Go use it. Um, and then if you want to contact me, here's all my information. Um, I am on these two things pretty much constantly. So if you want to tweet me, you probably get me immediately. Um, and email, I read immediately and might get back to you in a week. Um, <laughs> you feel this pain. <laughs> um, so my slides will be uh, posted as well um, on, the, uh, on the wiki page. If you have anything to add to it, please go add. Um, and now we've got five minutes? No, we've got four minutes. Two and a half. Okay, well, anyone who does not want to be a part of the Q&A, feel free to stand up and move, and I will not be offended, and I will be entirely grateful that you were here at all. So thank you all for listening to me, Babylon. I'll just leave that up there. Okay, oh, people want to talk. Michael, you had your hand up. Oh, maybe not. Maybe you were preparing to clap. We're going to do the Reich again. Um, so, anyone have anything? Oh, I have a comment. It's, you? It's not or like that. Actually, to help with the... So, I don't have to repeat these things. Um, ah. I'll just talk it. Yeah. Or that, or whatever. Um, that's not working. That's just... Come on, I'm going to talk it. You're recording. Oh, okay. Yeah, for recording. Quantitative, real-time, community metrics. Go. Yes, quantitative real-time community metrics. I really want to see that, but I believe it is... We'll talk about it yes, we can talk about it in an on-conference session as well, but who is that? That's Ashish doing that? Yeah, Mozilla does. Um, Wikimedia has a lot of... Um, Yeah. They don't have millions of dollars to manage their metrics. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, make it uh, so for the recording, the, the uh, commentary is that there are very large projects that do run this sort of community-based metrics. Um, but it needs to be easier for the small projects to do it. Kind of like the Google Analytics of open source project metrics uh, for community. And there is uh, a talk, I don't know if I missed it already, Ashish Laroya is doing... Um, was that last one? Yeah. It's great because this year we have video. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there were a lot of great talks in this slot. <laughs> it's because you want my help with something. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, Ashish is a great guy who loves talking about this stuff and knows a lot about it. Ashish runs Open Hatch, um, which is a great way to, uh, it doesn't cover a lot of the step zero yet, but if you were to contribute to it, maybe it would. Um, so other comments, questions? Other people, oh, come on, you got nothing for me? Yes, sir. You're Rogan? Okay. Okay. So the uh, question is, so he's had other projects which scratched very, very itchy itches and had no trouble finding contributors. Now he has a project which he believes scratches an itch, but he's not sure. And how does he work with that? It's called marketing. <laughs> I would like to refer you to my talk two years ago at Open Source Bridge where marketing is not evil. Same talk last year, OzCon, marketing is not evil. Yeah, marketing is a great thing. Uh, do market research. Talk to the people. Um, seek them out on email, Twitter, what have you, and actually confirm whether it scratches their itch. It's standard product development, right? Uh, it's going to be a lot of time and effort to, to manage this project, and you don't want to do it if there's no ROI there. But excellent question. Thank you. Someone else had a... Eric, he's in front. I'm sorry. Both sides, uh, as maintainer of a project and contributing patches to projects, that the maintainer doesn't have enough time at the time that the patch is submitted to like immediately review it. You know, they can say thanks. I'll have to you know review that and get it in to a release, and then it's you know a month and a half later or something, and they're they're writing back like you know we we want to keep using this code, but the patch isn't in a new release or whatever, and it's it's just a hassle for them waiting. Um, whether you're, you've submitted the patch or you're on the, the receiving side and you just don't have time right then to... You know. uh, delegation and trusted lieutenants. You are not in this alone. That is what open source is all about. You don't have to be the bottleneck, right? If you're the maintainer, you can do something to bring on people you trust who you can give them that commitment, right? Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, how would you attract a community manager? Wow. Awesome question. Yes, lots of money. Um, it's No, honest, I, I don't have experience with that. I cannot speak to that. Um, I would gladly brainstorm about it. Um, but frankly, you've got to have somebody who's passionate enough to take the time. Right. someone's good you know representation good name good you know work in the past and then utilize it for their own goods which yeah. a lot of people won't do or you know you have to throw a lot of money at people but if it's for an open source project usually people fall in your lap and people find them by happenstance so there's not a good middle ground. you may already have them in your community and you just haven't noticed yet so you, try asking crazy idea uh, uh, Figurehead, and there's no single, you know, community manager that it rotates. Either that it rotates every three months, or that you maybe have like three community people, and that they all do little parts of the job, and then they don't get burned out. As fast. Delegate. Yeah. You're not in this together. Yas, dear. Yes. yes. So, so also to, to you look like a volunteer with that, by the way, with your purple shirt. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, I need to be careful with my wardrobe in the future. If people um, ask you questions, that's why. Yes, well, this hasn't happened yet, but any minute now. Uh, so firstly, in answer to that question before I ask my own question, uh, which is that one of the great things about communities, um, and this is something you don't just see in open source communities, but in real world communities, is that people tend to take on the behavior that they see around them. So if you are able to set, as the leader of the community, a very positive and helpful attitude, um, then people see that as the standard operating procedure for your community and will do so. And then what you can do is, within that, you see the people who, if you, you know, become the change you wish to see in the world, then the people who are doing that most successfully are the most obvious candidates for community manager, right? So, um, so that is one other reason to do it. The question that I have is, to, is bit of a technical question, but it's do with step zero. 
Um, what I've wondered a lot is whether you can get a good step zero by instead of saying uh, clone this, git repo, then run make, run this, install these dependencies, etc. Do something more along the lines of here is a pre-built virtual machine or a box you can log into that has everything already set up. Right. Right. Yeah. So well, that's one. So there's the question about how do you. So the the question is. Um, or the, sorry, the answer given was um, many people aren't able to necessarily run that virtual machine. There's one thing I saw. I think Dreamwidth does this, which is they uh, if you become want to become a contributor, they give you an account on a shared box that has everything automatically deployed for you, and you can start. And there are steps whereby you can immediately start hacking on it, seeing the results of your work, and and commit. Does so anybody know if well, any I other seems like that? Uh, this. I don't know how many of you were at Schwern's talk yesterday. Simple questions should have simple answers. Yes, you were. Uh, yeah, the, the, all the Pearl people were there. Um, but really, it's something that everybody should be there. And it, it is something like this. Yeah, you've got the big long do this and then do that and then do this and then. But there could be a, possibly a way to make this easier for the end user. So if you think of it not as a technical problem but as a user problem, how do you make it really easy for the user? That Sometimes that is a lot of technical stuff you have to do, uh, but there are ways, for instance, in Ruby or Python, you can just go to the web and practice Ruby and Python. You don't necessarily have to, to install it on your machine. That, that's a really great way to get people started with using your stuff. Yes, sir? Um, it's a marketing problem. So, um, Could be. One of the things I've done on I go back to, uh, when we used to do the Ruby Code Bootcamp, and the marketing folks used to beat into us if you could not install it and do something meaningful as a random customer in, depending who you talk to, it, five to ten minutes, that was going to become shelfware. And it's, it, so whatever step zero is for your project, it, and I think that there is a step zero for this room to think about. It's not to get them to be a contributor. It's to, before they become a contributor, they have to be a user. People don't randomly show up and say, hey, I think this looks like a fascinating it's, That's a movie. valid assumption to start with. I mean, you yeah. have to start with something. And that's a good way to start. Because so how do they find your project to begin with? Right. Yeah. That's an awesome question to ask people who are coming. Hey, how do you know us? Um, and, that and then there's the how do they become a user? Because the first time they touch your website, that's that first chance you've got yeah. to maybe get them as a user. It's all branding at that point. To get um, to the developer. And even then, developers don't start necessarily in their head as a contributor. They're going to need to become a developer of themselves.